Dr. Ken Landau, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Fesenra or Benralizumab. This is a drug approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 2017 to treat people at least age 12 or older who have a severe type of asthma known as eosinophilic asthma. It's an add-on therapy. It doesn't substitute for other kind of medicines. And as a matter of fact, it is not a treatment for acute asthma. Now, asthma is a significant problem worldwide. There are probably about 300 million people who have asthma in the United States. It's estimated that about 30 million people have asthma. That means about 8 to 10 percent of the population. And 10 to 15 percent of the people with asthma have severe asthma that's refractory to our therapies and often uncontrollable. And half of the people with severe asthma have this particular type called eosinophilic asthma. And all that means is that a type of white blood cell known as the eosinophil is markedly elevated. So eosinophilic asthma accounts for probably about 5 percent of all asthma. The incidence is the same in men as it is in women. On the other hand, childhood asthma is more common in females than it is in males. Most asthma is relatively easy to take care of with inhaled corticosteroids, low dose, moderate dose. Symptoms tend to be wheezing and chest tightness and maybe some shortness of breath and maybe some coughing. But our understanding of asthma changed in about 1950. Up until that point, asthma was thought to be an allergic disorder. We call it extrinsic asthma. And then we discovered that there was something known as intrinsic asthma. Intrinsic asthma, more often in adults without any signs of allergy, suffered a more severe course, oftentimes could lead to death. Well, intrinsic asthma changed to difficult asthma. And then in about 2000, it was discovered that a lot of these asthmatics who had the really severe disease seem to have elevated levels of eosinophils, not only in the bloodstream, but also in the lungs. So if we were to do a biopsy, even in people who were receiving oral steroids, it would appear that the eosinophil was still present in markedly elevated levels inside the tissue. So eosinophilic asthma tends to develop in adults, but it could happen in adolescents. These people tend not to be suffering from allergies to pollens or danders or dusts or pets. They have increased white blood cell known as an eosinophil in the lungs and in the bloodstream and in the mucus. And the severity of the asthma tends to parallel the level of elevation of those eosinophils. Now, in the community setting, in clinical practice, it's relatively uncommon for the general practitioner or the family internist to see people who have this condition. And as a result, they're frequently misdiagnosed. They tend to complain oftentimes of shortness of breath on exertion, symptoms that might be more suggestive of chronic lung disease, COPD. They tend not to necessarily complain of wheezy attacks. And as a result, they're misdiagnosed as having COPD and then mistreated. Well, when we look at the level of inflammation, it occurs through the entire respiratory passageway all the way from the sinuses and the nasal passageways down into the lower portions of the lung. And yes, indeed, the people can have some wheezing symptoms, but they might really complain of shortness of breath, especially shortness of breath on exertion or chest tightness or cough, and they also could have stuffy nose or nasal drainage or chronic sinus infection, loss of the sense of smell. They can have nasal polyps and they could have middle ear inflammation with eosinophils instead of the inflammatory cells that are typically present. And these are the people who tend to have significant flares of the asthma when they take aspirin. Now, having all these eosinophils in the lungs and having them cause inflammation leads to remodeling of the airways, thickening of the basement membrane. And when you have thickening of the basement membrane, then you can't get the air from the air passageways into the bloodstream. And as a matter of fact, you can't even get the air all the way down to where in the respiratory passageways the, the lobules are that are going to allow the air to get in where you can't absorb it. You have persistent airflow limitation, decreased lung function, and you have the scar tissue that forms inside the lung. 
and then you have a poor quality of life and frequent exacerbations of the condition so that people are often treated with oral steroids, prednisone, at increasingly higher dosages and that can lead to problems and when you hear about severe asthma that leads to intubation or near fatal or even fatal attacks, chances are it's due to this particular condition. Most asthma is associated with abnormalities in the upper airways. Here with this condition, the eosinophilic asthma, it's all the way throughout the entire lung. And because of the severity of the condition, as I mentioned, people are oftentimes treated with prednisone, with oral cortisone. But oral cortisone, especially when taken for long periods of time, especially when taken at moderate to high dosage, leads to a number of side effects. Side effects ranging from impaired glucose tolerance and asthma and weight gain and osteoporosis and anxiety and depression and heart disease and even immunosuppression. Well, these eosinophils, once they're made in the bone marrow, they float around in the bloodstream for maybe about six to ten hours, and then they get in the tissue. And once they're in the tissue, in this case the lung, they last for somewhere between eight and twelve days. And then if something stimulates those eosinophils, they release all of the contents that are within the cell, and it's those contents within the asthma cell or within the eosinophil cell that lead to severe disease. So if we look at people who have this eosinophilic asthma and we look at their sputum, the amount of phlegm, the spit that they produce, we're often going to find a significant number of those eosinophils. And if we put them on Fisenra, those eosinophils are going to decrease by more than 90%, often 95 to 100%, within a shorter time period as a day or so. And that seems to be associated with a decrease in the severity of the asthma. If we do that with placebo, it's only going to happen in about half of the cases. So, first job is to decide, does the person have allergic asthma or does the person have eosinophilic asthma? If it's allergic asthma, that individual is going to have high levels of the antibody associated with allergies. We call that IgE. IgE, it's an antibody relative of gamma globulin. And if a person has elevated levels of IgE, then the person probably has extrinsic asthma, allergic asthma, and the standard medicine, or maybe Zolaire, an injectable, might be appropriate. On the other hand, if they have the eosinophilic asthma, then medicines like Fisenra might be very helpful. And Fisenra has some competition medicine called Nucala, another one called Syncare, and very soon a medicine called Dupixin. Dupixin's been on the market for a while for treating severe eczema in children, but it also seems to work very well on this particular type of asthma. Well, Fisenra leads to the death of those eosinophils, and not only does it lead to the death of the eosinophils, but the eosinophil doesn't open up. It just shrinks down on itself, so it can't release all of the substances. The substances that would cause flares of asthma, the major basic protein in the eosinophil, a cationic protein, a whole bunch of substances, and then there are chemokines and cytokines, all sorts of things that lead to constriction of the airway and edema and mucus overproduction. Well, that's going to be prevented by treatment with Fisenra. So let's look at what happens to the blood eosinophil count. So the eosinophil count is elevated. Let's say it's elevated to 300 or more in people with asthma. Placebo treatment doesn't do anything to the eosinophil count, but Fisenra is going to reduce it by about two-thirds, and it's going to work within a period of about a day. So let's look at people who have elevated eosinophils, let's say more than 300, so significant elevation. And these people have had at least three exacerbations, three flares of their asthma in the past year. Now they're also receiving the inhaled corticosteroids and the long-acting beta agonists, those sprays that you take, those inhalers, and they're also taking oral corticosteroids. So what happens when we compare a group of people who get Fisenra versus placebo. Well, instead of having three or more flares per year, 
the likelihood of exacerbation falls to only 35 or 40 percent per year in people who are receiving the Fisenra versus about 50 percent in people who are receiving placebo. So that really translates to one and a half attacks of asthma every two years. Instead of three attacks every year, now it's only one and a half attacks every two years in people who are receiving Fisenra versus one to one and a half attacks a year in people who are receiving the placebo in addition to all of their other medicines. Now additionally, if we look at the rate of hospitalization, it doesn't seem to be changed with the Fisenra, but let's look at what it can do to the dose of steroids, the dose of prednisone. People who were receiving Fisenra were able to reduce their steroids in about 75% of instances versus only about 25% or one in four people who received the placebo were able to reduce the steroid dose. Well, if we look at the likelihood of getting down to less than five milligrams of steroids, that's sort of a tolerable dose. Among people receiving Fisenra, 60% were able to do that versus only about 30% in the people receiving the placebo. And if we look at the people who were initially were taking relatively low doses of steroids, let's say less than 12 and a half milligrams a day, well, in the people receiving Fisenra, half of them were able to completely discontinue the steroids. Only about 20% of the people receiving the placebo were able to do that. Now, with the Fisenra, we're going to have an increase in our ability to get air out of the lungs. And it's impressive, but it's not super whopping increase. If we have questionnaires about how your quality of life is going, well, they don't really seem to be all that much different between the Fisenra and the placebo. Now, there is something known as the asthma symptom score, and that's significantly different, significantly improved on the people who are receiving the Fisenra versus the placebo, but whether that's really clinically significant remains to be seen. The improvement on Fisenra occurs as early as four weeks after beginning therapy, and once you start the therapy, every year you should have your asthma reevaluated to see if you really need to continue taking the medicine. Question is, does it have any side effects? Sure, all medicines have side effects, and the side effects from Fisenra seem to principally be in the allergic family. So people can have hypersensitivity reactions, not all that common, but can be dramatic. Anaphylactic reactions or angioedema swelling in the tongue, difficulty breathing, hives or rashes. Well, that's significant, obviously. And it's also important that people who begin the therapy make certain that they understand that they can't just stop their regular asthma therapies. Just because you're adding this new medicine on doesn't mean you can stop the other medicines. Later on, you can taper the steroids, as I mentioned, but not right to start. And there's a question about helminth infections because the allergy cells seem to keep them in control. So the question is, well, if you live in an area where you have a high incidence of being infected with tapeworms, roundworms, flatworms, flukes, other kind of parasites, well, you should probably treat them before you begin therapy. The, the typical side effects are basically no different than with a placebo. So you're not more likely to have a headache or a sore throat or a fever. You can have some injection site reaction, a little bit of pain or some itching or some swelling, even a small bump. Is it safe for pregnant women? It hasn't really been studied. We know that since it's a globulin, it certainly can get through the placenta. Not that it's going to do any harm, but we certainly don't recommend it either for pregnant women or women who are breastfeeding. And at least at the present time, there's only a small study evaluating people who are relatively young it doesn't show any harm in people who are young. The dose is given by an injection. And to start off, the injection is once a month. Once a month, subcutaneous, just like you would with insulin. And then after the third injection, then it's given every other month. For whatever reason, it seems that every month, if you continue, isn't really better than every other month. The shelf life of the medicine is about three years. It should be kept in the refrigerator, but not in the freezer. 
once it's injected into the system, it's going to have a half-life of about 15 days. It's going to be degraded by the standard ways the body gets rid of the gamma globulin and all of the similar substances. It's not dependent on kidney function, not dependent on liver function, and it doesn't appear to have any drug interactions. The stuff itself is clear and it's opalescent liquid. You should take it out of the refrigerator about 30 minutes before it's injected. It should be injected within 24 hours after coming out of the refrigerator, but it should be given by a healthcare worker because of the potential for hypersensitivity reaction within several hours after therapy. So the person should be monitored and there should be an auto-injector of epinephrine at hand, just in case. Well, because it's so expensive, the insurance companies have certain criteria that you have to meet in order to get the medicine. Now, AstraZeneca, they said that they wanted to file not only for the extrinsic asthma, I'm sorry, for the intrinsic asthma, for this eosinophilic asthma, but they also wanted to file to get approval for using Fisenra to treat severe chronic obstructive lung disease, or COPD, as an add-on therapy. They said that in February of 2018, but unfortunately in May of 2018, the second of two studies came out, phase three studies, and it showed that the medicine was not effective. So they're not going to get approval for that. Well, we have several other drugs. So there's Fisenra, but the first drug in its family was Nucala. That's injected every month subcutaneously. After that came Syncare. Syncare is injected every month, but it has to be injected intravenously instead of subcutaneously. And then Fisenra came out, and it's injected for the first three months monthly, and then after that, every other month, and pretty soon, Dupixin is going to come out, and the question is probably that's going to be injected every two weeks, probably injected at home. And remember, these medicines are for the eosinophilic type of asthma, not for the allergic asthma. All of these medicines that we're talking about, the Syncare, the Nucala, and the Fisenra, work on IL-5, either IL-5 in the bloodstream so it can't get to the eosinophil or on the receptor on the eosinophil so even if the IL-5 gets there, it can't work. And the IL-5 is extraordinarily important for the eosinophil for its growth and differentiation and for the recruitment into the tissues and the activation so that it lets out its toxic compounds in the tissues and even for the survival of the eosinophil. So it's a good idea, at least if you have asthma, to interfere with that IL-5 function. There are other ways that we can go about the story. For instance, the dupixin goes IL-4, a different kind of a chemical. Now, AstraZeneca came out with Fisenra, and it's heavily marketing Fisenra right now. It's third in its class. It came out after Nucala and Syncare. And the cost for the first year of therapy, if you wanted to pay cash for the drug, is $47,000. What? $47,000? Yes, that's right, $47,000. And for the second year and subsequent years, cash price right now is between $35,000 and $41,000. That means uh, an injection of this medicine. Cash price is about $6,700. That's a substantial amount. So the drug is okay. It seems to work pretty well for some people, for many people, but it's so very expensive and it's certainly not a cure. Not even a miracle for most of the people. Just another expensive treatment. And interestingly, the drug companies come out with these copay cards so you don't recognize what the real cost of the medicine is. Well, you know how much you can get off by a copay card? Most people think, well, maybe $50, $100. No, the copay card for this drug is worth $10,000. So it limits your expense. It cuts down. You don't have to come up with $10,000 out of your pocket cash. It's just the insurance company that has to come out of the money, out of the pocket with the money. So you should know the price of your medicines. And whenever you hear medicines heavily advertised on the television, you should go to a site like GoodRx or go down to your pharmacy and ask how much that drug costs. And I guarantee you, that the medicines that you hear advertised 
They might not be blockbusters, at least as far as healthcare is concerned, but they sure could be bankbusters as far as your pocketbook is concerned. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.